Let's begin with saying some Tehillim, some Psalms together. For the situation in Ukraine in general, and particularly, of course, for our brothers and sisters there. Faithfully led by the hundreds of Shluchim who could leave, but chose not to. So let's say together, friends, two chapters of Tehillim. And say it slowly and please join me. Get a Tehillim if you can. Chapters 120, 121. Shira Malus Elad Ezri me yema de noi, oi se shamai boarets. Yetain la metra glacha or yonum shimracha. In hela yonum bal yishon shame by Israel. The noi shimracha de ne tilcha jaji minacha. Yoyma ma shemesh la yakeka, viarech baloilo. The noi shmorcha me colorado, yishmeres napshacha. The noi shmeteshcha viacha me ata viat oilum. God will guard your going out and your coming in from now and evermore. Amen. Sorry. Okay, friends. Yeah, quite the unbelievable situation that we are facing. Unbelievable in the sense that uh, none of us have expected in 2022 we'd, we'd be witness. Witness to such an event, but number one, Hashem runs the world. And it will all turn out for the best. We hope it should do so without delay. And dear God, no lives lost. We're going to dedicate, as Debbie had, had mentioned, today's class to our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. And as a prayer and offering for peace, Peace there and peace all over the world. Today we're going to look at the opening verse of the Megillah. By Yehi B'mei Achash Veirosh, the Megillah begins with these words. It was in the days of Achash Veirosh. King Achashverosh, Hamoylech, Mehoidu Viad Kush, who ruled from Hodu to Kush. It's not clear what exactly these particular states are. There are many views. But one thing is clear he ruled the entire world. Sheva Vaesim Umeya Medina, the Megillah goes on to say, 127 countries. That's the opening verse of the, of the Megillah. First question. The story of the Megillah is not the story of Ahasuerus. The story of the Megillah is the story of the Jews and the threat 
of extinction, God forbid, and their salvation through Esther and Mordechai. So why does the Megillah begin with it? It was in the days of Ahasuerus. It should have begun, it was in the days of Mordechai and Esther in Shushan Abira, in the capital city of Shushan. And then the Megillah will go on to say, describe the situation where they found themselves. It was in Shushan, the king was a Hashverosh. That's secondary. To make our question clearer and stronger. When the Torah describes the slavery in Egypt and the subsequent exodus, it does not begin the account with it was in the days of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. It's not how the Torah describes the story. The Torah tells us the focal point are the Jews and their story. They went down to Egypt and they were enslaved and subsequently redeemed. It's strange then that the Megillah should begin with, and it was in the days of King Ahasuerus. There are many answers to that question. One of the, the basic answers is that, in fact, the Megillah, as, it, as we know it, was written by Mordechai and Esther and incorporated within the Persian historical record, the Persian protocol, the Persian chronicles. That's the basic reason why God's name doesn't appear in the Megillah. They didn't want to make any reference to God. A, it would not have been accepted, and they wanted the story to be part of their record. And B, if they had made a reference to a deity, to God, then the Persians would have mistranslated that and applied it to any of their own um, idolatrous objects of worship. And so therefore, Mordechai and Esther avoided the mention of God altogether. So for the same reason, on a simple level, the Megillah begins with it was in the days of Ahasuerus because they're writing this for the, to be part of the chronicles of the history of Persia. Now, one of the reasons, by the way, it's called the Megillus Esther. A deeper allusion, since I'm on the subject. The simple reason is she wrote it. She was the prime author with Mordechai. So, of course, it's called Megillus Esther. But a deeper, a deeper allusion, a deeper allusion is that the word Megillah means to reveal. The galot. The word Esther means to conceal. Which means that the scroll is written in such a way that it has profound messages and teachings, but hidden. And the student needs to probe and uncover and discover its inner layers of meaning. Entire volumes have been written on the Megillah, on simple verses and words and turn a phrase, which were cleverly and divinely inspired, uh, written author by Mordechai and Esther, so that it's forever the Megillah's Esther. It's always revealing hithero, hidden teachings, truths, insights. So back to our question. Why does it begin with, and it was in the days of Ahasuerus? So again, the simple answer is because it's part of the Persian protocol, and that's how it's going to begin, as Ahasuerus being the key protagonist and the hero of the story, um, as it turns out, on the simple level. The story begins with Ahasuerus, the Megillah, and ends with him, with his rule the end of the Megillah in chapter 10, that final chapter. But we're going to go a little bit deeper, again, because it's Megillah's Esther. The simple narrative contains profound allusions and messages. Here's one of them. 
in the opening words, and it was in the days of Achashverosh. Friends, we have a principle with respect to the language of Tanakh, of scripture, that goes as follows. Whenever it says, Vayihi, and it was, using those exact words, it hints to a troubling time. So here's the message. The very beginning of the story, before Haman's nefarious plan and plot to destroy the Jews, before that, uh, the opening chapters of the Megillah, for many Jews, life had never been better. The Jews lived and were allowed absolute freedom of worship, economic freedom. They spanned all 127 provinces throughout the great Persian Empire and beyond, beyond the classic Persian Empire. Mordechai, the Jew, was appointed, as the Megillah relates in the early chapters, viceroy to the king, having saved his life from a plot to poison him. Esther is the queen. So friends, you have a Jewish queen, you have a Jewish second to the king. The opening verses of the Megillah describe this great banquet that lasted 180 days for the entire realm and then seven days in the capital city of Shushan to which the Jews were invited and honored and given the choice of kosher wine and kosher food, glut kosher, wined and dined, fetid. This is all before Haman. So the early part of the story, it was in the days of Achashverosh. Well, those early days were wonderful. And yet the Megillah says, Vayihi. Vayihi always denotes something not merely foreboding in that it will lead or led to dark days, but those days were dark. Those days were dark. One would argue that they were the, it was the best period of Jewish history um, since the destruction of the temple, rivaling our own day. And the Megillah says, by Yehi, Remember, we are in exile. The queen may be Jewish. The second to the king is Mordechai, the Jew. Mordechai, an unabashed proud Jew, beard and keeper, a member of the Sanhedrin. He is the viceroy to the king. But we are in exile. The temple lies in ruins. And we should never be lulled into a false sense of security. Not only because things can turn around overnight, which they did, but even during the good time, it's golos, friends. We're foreigners. We're strangers. We don't belong in Persia. We don't belong in Canada. We're here in exile. Our place is the Holy Land, where we will return in the final redemption never to leave again. We must remember that we are forever displaced, no matter how beautiful our homes or expensive our cars. That's the message of Vayihi Bimeyach Hashverosh. The opening words, before you read further, Vayihi means, and it was a dark time, Eina elat sorrow, it's sorrowful. But he denotes a sorrowful time. Notwithstanding, it was during the time of the benevolent King Achashveresh, Esther and Mordechai being in positions of power and control and influence. We are in Golas. 
we are in exile till Mashiach comes. We must never forget that. Never become comfortable and complacent and feel that we have arrived. And life is good as is. We must toil assiduously towards the transformation of the world and redemption. All right, friends, so that's a message in the opening word. Let's, let's continue examining this, this verse. Let me share it with you again in simple English. And it was in the days of Achashverosh who ruled from Hodu till Kush, 127 countries. The Talmud in Tractate Megillah records, I'll read it to you, a fascinating, interesting discussion between the two sages Rav and Shmuel, quoted throughout the Talmud, debating many, many subjects. And here is a debate between the two. But as we will presently demonstrate, like all debates in Torah, they are not in conflict. Rather, each one conveys a different dimension of the same essential truth. What I just told you now is one of the great revelations, revolutions of the Rebbe's voluminous teachings. You can see behind me, mind you. No, I'm going to turn this way. I'll just show you, I'm sitting in my office at home. Uh, that bookshelf you're looking at, half of it are the Rebbe's works. Uh, third, what you're looking at now is all the Rebbe's works. Mind blowing, beyond mind blowing, staggering. But one of the great revolutions, revelations in his teachings is he addresses arguments amongst the sages and the Talmud of which there are endless, and always demonstrates how they are not in conflict. But as I just said, each view expresses another dimension of one transcendent common truth. Case in point, Rav and Shmuel. So the verse reads that the Hashavedish reigned from Hodu to Kush. Rav said, Hodu is a country at one end of the world, and Kush is a country at the other end of the world. That's the simple meaning of the verse. The verse wants to um, express the breadth, the length, the embrace of his rule. And it was from one end of the world to the other. So how far away were Hodu and Kush? As far as possible. From one end of the world to the other. That's the view of Rav. Shmuel says, Hodu and Kush are situated next to each other. So why is the Megillah saying that he ruled from Hodu until Kush? That doesn't bring out the enormity and the power and the, and the strength of his rule if the two countries are situated adjacent to each other. If they are far apart and he ruled from one to the other, you understand what the Megillah is trying to tell us. But what's the Megillah telling us if, according to Shmuel, they were adjacent? Shmuel continues and explains. The Megillah means to say that just as Ahasuerus reigned with ease over the adjacent countries of Hodu and Kush, so too he reigned with ease from one end of the world to the other. All right, so on the surface it would appear that Rav and Shmuel are in conflict. Were Hodu and Kush situated next to each other or as far apart as possible? Rav said, one end of the world to the other. Shmuel said they were next to each other. And the Megillah is saying that just like he controlled with ease and ruled utterly, complete and utter control over neighboring countries, so too he ruled over the 127 provinces. They seem to be in conflict. 
but they're not, as the commentaries point out and the Rebbe explains. How so? Maybe you can figure it out. Perhaps you did. Let me give you a hint. The sages of the Talmud, unlike the contemporary uh, scientists and thinkers and astronomers, knew that the world was round, not flat, as everybody else believed at the time, and wouldn't discover for millennia. And we see this here in this argument. Well, not argument, because there never is an argument, but as we'll soon explain, two dimensions of the same truth. The world is round, friends. So Hodu and Kush are at once next to each other, and then at once the most furthest apart, one in the world to the other, because the world is round. If the world is flat, both opinions cannot be um, reconciled. If the world is flat, and they can't be both together and far apart at the same time. Only if the world is round. Hence, vo both views are complementary. Clear? This is one indication. Where anybody ever asks you, or you have an in interesting uh, um, proof from the Talmud that the sages understood the world is round. He has just... They didn't state it because it's obvious, but you see it in these two views that Hodu and Kush are both adjacent and as far from each other as physically possible because the world is round. You follow? Now, what are they saying? What are they bringing out? They're not in conflict, but they're saying they're, they're highlighting two different complementary messages that the Megillah is saying. Rav is conveying the obvious message. Achashverosh ruled over the whole world. So he focuses on the distance between the two. Shmuel wants to bring out, not only did he rule over the whole world, but he ruled with such an iron fist it is control over even those physically distant from him were the same as his control over Hud and Kush, which were adjacent to each other and close to him. So they're bringing out two dimensions of the same message. The Megillah wants to tell us, A, he ruled over the world, B, with complete control. We get these two messages from Rav and Shmuel, who explain that Hodu and Kush are next to each other, which means he ruled the entire expanse outside of these two provinces, which means the circumference of the entire world. So Rav is bringing out that the Megillah is conveying the quantity of his rule, and Shmuel brings out the quality. Just like Hodu and Kush are adjacent, it's easy to control over nearby countries than distant countries. So too did he equally control and govern all of the 127 provinces in between Hodu and Kush. As we travel around the world, as they were from the back of Hodu and Kush. Is that clear, friends? And you don't need a little, um, yeah? Heads up, comment. Clear. Yeah, okay. Now the question is this, the Rebbe goes deeper. Why is it necessary for the Megillah to identify the names of the countries? The Megillah could have conveyed the message I just told you, both of the qualitative and qualitative, quantitative and qualitative rule of a Hashverosh without identifying particular names. The Megillah could have said he ruled over 127 provinces with an iron fist or equally and avoided this whole reference to Hodu and Kush and Rav and Shmuel's explanation. 
Answer. Let's look at the names Hodo and Kush. Now, again, it's not clear. There are different opinions as to where exactly these places are in the world. The average, or I should say the common translated Megillah probably says from India to Ethiopia, but that's not universally uh, held. So let's not pin it to a particular country, but leave it in the Hebrew terms, whatever the country is. We are going to go deeper now symbolically. The very words hodu, hodu means glory, hodu means glory. Kush means dark. What's the Megillah say? Friends, there are different societies. There are enlightened societies rep represented by the word Hodu. There are more primitive societies represented by the word Kush. Now you would think the decree which follows Hamon's meteoric rise to power and we explained how this happened. And Hamon's irrational hatred of the Jews that he inherited from Amalek and bequeathed down the ages to Nazi Germany. Haman hates the Jews and seeks their utter destruction. You would think when this decree comes out by the king, by the king's signet, 127 provinces, not every country would cooperate. The more primitive ones, perhaps yes, the enlightened ones, less so, or perhaps the opposite. The so-called enlightened ones would be more acquiesce to the king's desire for whatever calculation they have. And perhaps the simpler, more primitive societies would have resisted to some degree the wholesale slaughter of an innocent people. You would think. And although they might have, the Megillah is telling us that from Hodu till Kush, from the enlightened countries to the more underdeveloped, more primitive countries, he ruled with an iron fist and this plan of genocide was going to be carried out faultlessly. No resistance. Near or far, all embraced equally the plan, the final solution to the Jewish problem, which makes the miracle therefore all the greater when the end of the story, the Jews rise up and destroy their enemies and successfully defend themselves. So this is the reason the Megillah begins with from Hoido till Kush, to make us realize the extent of the miracle. By making us realize the extent of the threat, it came equally. He ruled equally. And it was accepted equally by the enlightened and by the more backward societies. He ruled over Africa. All of them responded when the edict came, kill the Jews with equal allegiance and enthusiasm. Which the Megillah wants to point out because it makes us appreciate the great miracle, A, and B, the great danger that a Jew potentially faces wherever he or she may live and never to take his safety and security for granted. Although I want to add parenthetically, I don't mean to be an alarmist, 
Number one, Mashiach is around the corner. We hope what's happening now is the last birth pangs before redemption. We also want to add, with respect to the United States of America, and I hope that Canada, I hope, would be part of this truth. The Rebbe had said, America is a malchus shel chesed. It's a society based on chesed, on kindness and love, unique in the annals of history. Moreover, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not mistaken, Chassidei Umar Salam, the righteous Gentile, which we have been blessed with throughout the ages, not in numbers nearly enough, but nonetheless greatly appreciated in Europe, even during the darkest days. In general, Hasidi Umar Sa'ilam characterizes the North American non-Jew overall. So do not be alarmed, but at the same time, remember the first message, Vayihi, we're in exile, it's a dark time until redemption comes. So let's go back to the point that I'm saying now. And that is, why does the Megillah point out that he ruled not just over the whole world and not just over the whole world easily, but from Hoido to Kush, the nuance here is enlightened, backward, all embraced, no resistance. How great, therefore, was the miracle of our salvation. Now, further insight. There's a commentary teaching about sages in the Middash that goes as follows. In what merit did Esther rule over 127 provinces? The answer, because she was a daughter, a descendant of Sarah, our founding mother, who lived 127 years. End of quote. Again, in what merit did Esther rule over 127 countries? In the merit of being a daughter, a member of the Jewish people, a daughter of Sarah, Sarah, who lived, as the verse tells us in Pasha's Chai Sarah, 127 years. And the question is as follows. Our sages that I just quoted say, in what merit did Esther rule over 127 countries as if that's something that Esther welcomed? Do you really think Esther wanted to be the wife of the king? She only agreed because she sensed that somehow she would be of service to her people. She sacrificed her life approaching the king, unbidden. But my dear friends, a much greater sacrifice for her was to live with him. So what do our sages mean when they say, what merit? Do you think she reveled in the fact that she was queen of 127 countries? Do you think she took glory in this power? Certainly not. What do our sages mean? And what is the meaning, the link, the connection? Because Sarah lived 127 years. Because the, the numbers match. 127 countries, 127 years. There must be some deeper meaning and connection, and of course there is. Which I'll now share with. Let's look at Sarah's 127 years. This is a teaching I believe you, you all remember. The Torah says, not that she lived 127 years, not the way the Torah frames it. The Torah says she lived 100 years and 20 years and seven years. Me'a shona, ve'esrim shona, ve'sheva shona, which prompts the question, just say 127 years. Why 100 years, 20 years, 
seven years. So Rashi explains, Rashi wrote a commentary to answer the most elementary questions that a person would have reading scripture. This is an obvious question. Rashi answers, <clears throat> to teach us that all of her years were equally good, devoted, loyal, and righteous. Her childhood years, the years of her teens and her 20s, and in her old age. Some of us, many of us, have ups and downs, if not perhaps almost all of us. Certainly as we get older, we become more mellow, and we begin to consider life and death and values, children, grandchildren, legacy, the hereafter. Age has a way of softening us, most of us. There are some that age fossilizes and hardens, tragically. But for most, I'd venture to say old age brings with it a maturity to some degree or another. The impetuousness of youth, lust, desire, uh, the quest for power and control wane over time. There's the innocence of childhood, there's the idealism of, of the teen years, and then there's 20s and 30s, the quest to make our mark in the world in one way or another. With all of its challenges and vicissitudes and ups and downs, for Sarah, it was all equal. The same Sarah throughout. Loyal, devoted, selfless. That's why the Torah says, seven years, 100 years, 20 years, and seven years, Compare each block and see the common denominator. All kulon shav in the toy. Just as an aside or more detail here, our sages are specific about how we compare these blocks. Seven, twenty, and one hundred. When comparing the seven and the twenty, our sages say that she was as beautiful as twenty as she was when she was seven. And that's a surprising comment, because you you know surely a girl a woman is more beautiful at twenty than seven. What does this mean? She was as beautiful at twenty as she was at seven. One of the answers is she was as innocent about her beauty when she was twenty as she was when she was a child of seven. Of course, at 20, she developed into a woman and so on. But her innocence about her beauty was the same as a seven-year-old child. Close brackets. That's just further detail into her piety, into her true beauty, her innocence, her devotion. Mind you, Sarah was no, she was very a strong personality, very strong personality. As we all know from her history and life. But this was true strength. Now let's get back to Esther. So the Torah says 100 years and 20 years and 7 years. That we compare these blocks of life and realize that they're all equal. Put that aside for a moment and I want you to consider the following. And then we'll get back to Esther in particular. When news broke that Haman had successfully bribed the king to affix his signature to the, God forbid, total annihilation of the Jews, friends, that was a full year before the actual date of the final solution. For an entire year, the entire population knew that the sword of death was poised above their heads, their throats, or at their throat. And this is a little known fact, but I'll share it with you. Any Jew, man, woman, or child, who would renounce their faith would be spared. 
Nobody did. Not one. Not young, not old. Man, woman, or child. Not the scholarly, not the simple, not the pious. And even the not so pious. Everybody uniformly remained resolute to die as Jews if necessary and not to renounce their faith. Echoing the many shluchim in Ukraine that refused to leave, will leave and remain with their flock. If they can, their flock, then they will go with them. But they will not lead them to their faith. They're staying there with their wives and their children and their husbands. So what happened in the story of Purim? Across the board, all ages and all degrees of observance, all Jews rose to the occasion equally and uniformly and said, we are Jews, proud Jews, and will remain so till the end. And that brought about the great victory, the great salvation. So what are we saying today? 127 countries uniform in their desire to annihilate the Jews, notwithstanding the vast cultural and sociological differences between country in the heart of Africa and countries near and adjacent to Persia, enlightened countries. And that terrible decree was nullified because of the 127 years of Sarah that inspired the Jews through Esther. Like Sarah's years, despite the vicissitudes and the ups and downs and different challenges, she remained uniformly loyal. Esther inspired that in her people. No matter the age, the level of piety, observance of scholarship, when it came to the bottom line, you can save yourself if you renounce your Jewish identity. Nobody did. The Pintaliyid, the core essence of the Jewish neshama, shone forth, burst into brilliant flame and light. Esther inspired this, inspired by Sarah our founding mother. That's the deeper meaning of the otherwise strange statement of our, state, of our sages. In what merit did Esther rule over 127 provinces? What that means is, how did Esther inspire this Renaissance amongst her fellow Jews throughout the realm of Ahasuerus? despite the fact that they were the pious Jews and they were the observant and they were the assimilate, ones that assimilated young and old. How did she touch their core? Because she invoked and was inspired by the example of our first mother, Sarah, who throughout all the challenges of her life remained connected to her central Jewish spark, which is one with Hashem. And she ignited that in all the Jews throughout the realm, not just in physically different places, but in their, notwithstanding their external differences, they became one. And that countered the one unity of the, the, of the embrace of their destruction that all 127 countries had equally we're all equally ready to engage in that kind of unholy, evil, dark unity was counted, illuminated, nullified by the unity of the Jewish people. Facilitated by Esther 
inspired by Sarah. From Hodo till Kush, the enlightened Jew, the less enlightened Jew, all of them, at this moment of, of this critical moment, are you in? God forbid, out. Who are you? The Jews embrace their Jewishness. Ready for the ultimate sacrifice. And that precipitated the great salvation, the great miracle of Purim, the great transformation. And so, my dear friends, may it be for us. This is not a war on the Jews, to be sure. And so we pray for salvation and peace for everyone. Dear God, we direct our hearts to heaven. You who orchestrate and govern all things. Please, we beg of you, we beseech of you. May this conflict come to a peaceful resolution without delay. May there be no bloodshed, no blood spilled. Somehow as you, like on a chessboard, are moving the pieces. Surely, dear God, it is in order to arrive at only one destination and one conclusion, the ultimate victory, victory of Mashiach, of your kingdom established on earth, where all will serve you in unity, the whole world as one, from the great prophecies of your Torah. Love they call on Shechem Echad. They will serve you all with one consent, shoulder to shoulder, unified, and your light and holiness will emanate from Jerusalem, from the Beit HaMikdash, to the whole world forever. Amen. Thank you, dear friends, for joining. And let's continue our prayers and acts of goodness and kindness. And hear good news and joyful news. A wonderful week. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you.